The fact that the Islamic State claimed responsibility for this attack in Iran, does that lower the temperature or does that just raise it further in terms of the overall feeling right now in the Middle East? Well, it certainly adds to a very complicated picture in the region right now. But I do think it takes a little bit of the pressure off at least the U.S. in terms of you know, Iran sort of saying in the days leading up to this revelation that the U.S. was connected to this or that Israel may have been behind it. So it sort of shifts uh, the focus, obviously, to the Islamic State rather than the U.S. or its allies. But it adds to a very complicated picture. We know that we've had some uh, several attacks uh, in the Red Sea or, or a few attacks in the Red Sea, but certainly the threat of many more. And the U.S. has organized a coalition to help guide ships through, through that uh, very busy, at times, waterway. And so we w we're looking to see how that will affect commerce and, and, and how all that's working. So it doesn't help matters in, in the broader scheme of things because it does add to a very, as I said before, complicated picture. And it indicates that there are some threats out there that really haven't been accounted for yet. But it does take some of the scrutiny and some of the pressure off of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And we know that you know the Secretary of State yep. will be visiting the region soon. So um, it's it's good timing for him potentially because he doesn't have to address those questions, but it doesn't help him solve the crisis in Israel and Gaza. Well, to that exact point, Dan, he, this is a, one of a number of trips he has made to the Middle East since October 7th when Hamas first uh, conducted those attacks in Israel. And given everything you just described, what's happening in the Red Sea, the idea that Iran now has sent a warship there, even though this co coalition is in place Big container ship companies still aren't going through that waterway, even though that that task force is in place. It raises the question of whether or not diplomacy and deterrence can still work or if it really has to be military action and potentially offense as well. Well, certainly um, they go together. And I think that um, what we've seen with Secretary Blinken's travels is an attempt to kind of keep a lid on things. Right. So. We know that there's a lot of military activity in the region right now. Obviously, Israel is ca continuing to carry out its operations in Gaza. Um, but what the U.S. is trying to prevent is the spread of this conflict to other countries or other parts of this region. And to a certain extent, they've been successful in keeping a lid on things, although what you see is a lot of sort of harassment actions by the Houthi rebels, which are, of course, backed by Iran, some strikes on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. You see a lot of the U.S.'s adversaries basically taking advantage of the chaos of the moment to test the U.S.'s resolve in the region, the, the forces, the strength of the forces and things like that. So seeing it a, a really a, a, a very... Uh, an attack that was reminiscent of even what we saw at the sort of the withdrawal of Afghanistan mm. um, uh, just a couple of years ago indicates that there's still a lot of uh, activity that will continue to, to occur in this region that we can't totally control or account for. And that's just the Middle East. The U.S., of course, also is keeping a close eye on other conflicts as well, including the ongoing war in Ukraine. And Admiral Kirby also brought that up at today's briefing. Just take a listen to what he said. We assess that Russia intends to purchase missile systems from Iran. The most effective response to Russia's horrific violence against the Ukrainian people is to continue to provide Ukraine with vital air defense capabilities and other types of military equipment. To do that, we need Congress to approve our supplemental funding request for Ukraine without delay. So, Megan, what, uh, what are the prospects looking like for the actual approval of that supplemental request at this point? Well, right now, that supplemental request is contingent upon a number of other negotiations. You have an ongoing border negotiation, mm -hmm. and you have talks to avert a government shutdown come January 19th. Um, this all really hinges on House Speaker Mike Johnson and what he's willing to give and take in these negotiations. Many of the ultra-conservatives in the House oppose this Ukraine aid, and, and there's little that can be done to, to sway them on this. So is he willing to, to risk his job, like we saw with his predecessor, to get the Ukraine aid through mm. remains to be seen. And a lot of it's going to depend on what kind of deal he can strike with Democrats and with Senate Democrats and Senate Republicans who are negotiating on a separate track 
on the, the U.S. border with Mexico to, to deal with the, the migrant crisis, as well as funding to keep the government open. There's a January 19th deadline, and yeah. Congress gets back next week. So that gives them about 10 days. Yeah, it's not a lot of time. And, and to your point about how the border security issue is what Ukraine aid is contingent upon, it seems that at least some House Republicans are also saying keeping the government open is also contingent upon what happens at the border. Shut it down or we shut the government down. Yes, it's... It, it is. There are so many moving pieces at the moment, and, and they're adding more all the time. There's there's even talk on the Hill right now about potentially coming to some kind of a tax deal um, that would be retroactive um, <laughs> and would include things like R&D credits and a child tax credit. Um, and these are always sweeteners to try to get people on board with this legislation. Johnson is dealing with uh, a very small majority in the House. We're talking just a handful of members. And in the Senate, you need 60 votes to do anything. So it, it is really all going to come to a head next week. Um, they need to have some kind of agreement in place that, that then they can carry into the, the following week to avert the shutdown and to get some of these other balls moving. Well, as you say, Congress still actually isn't back in Washington, but that doesn't mean we aren't still getting new things uh, from, from Capitol Hill, including a report that was issued, Megan, by House Democrats today regarding former President Trump that says his hotels received at least $7.8 million in payments from foreign governments and their representatives during his presidency. How significant is this? What is this about? So, and the bulk of that money came from Chinese officials, I think mm. in excess of five million. Um, this is certainly a bit of counter-programming to the ongoing impeachment inquiry that, that the, the oversight committee, which, which Raskin is the top Democrat on, which Republicans on that are carrying out on over President Joe Biden regarding mm -hmm. his own family finances. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's counter-programming to that. Will it go anywhere? Likely not, but it certainly gives them lots of cannon fire heading into the impeachment inquiry and into the primaries as well.